Welcome everybody to this event, the Ukrainian refugee crisis, Eastern Europe and beyond. The first in a new series titled Ceasing Now on the Russia-Ukraine War. My name's Ben Noble, Associate Professor of Russian Politics at UCL Cease, and I'm the coordinator of the Ceasing Now series. The purpose of this series is to discuss current developing issues in the Cease region to help members of the media, policy and academic communities, as well as the general public to understand what's going on. We do this by bringing together an expert set of panelists to present their thoughts before opening up to questions from the audience. Following Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the ongoing war, it's now more important than ever for CIS to bring its expertise to bear on the most significant disruption to countries in the CIS region and beyond. The sessions of this new series will each tackle a particular topic, today the refugee crisis, but in future sessions we're likely to cover a wide range of issues from cultural responses to the war in Ukraine, to opposition in Russia, to the economic implications of sanctions. Even though these sessions are being hosted at CEASE, a key feature of this series is the central presence of non-CEASE experts and voices from Ukraine and beyond. We are extremely grateful for the time panelists are giving to take part in these sessions. I should also add that the new series is only one way in which the school is responding to the war. Further information on the full range of activities is available on the Cease on Ukraine webpage of the Cease website. Information about future sessions will be disseminated on the website as well as through the Cease, uh, uh, the school's social media channels. Finally, these sessions are being recorded and recordings will be posted on the Cease YouTube channel very soon after the events. With all that said, let me hand over to the chair of today's event, Dr. Agnieszka Kubal, lecturer in sociology at Cease. Agnieszka, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Ben, uh, for this lovely introduction, for giving us the space and the framework within Ceasing Now to be able to host this event, which talks about uh, today I, I uh, have the pleasure to have speakers from uh, Eastern Europe uh, and Germany to talk about the consequences and the immediate responses of the mass population displacement, which we have seen uh, as a result of the war in Ukraine. Let me just share my screen so you can see the most recent uh, figures uh, on the displacement that has been published by UNHCR uh, as of today. As a way of introduction, when I was sending around information about this webinar, we had slightly over 2 million Ukrainian refugees. Now, as of today, there are nearly 3, mil 3 million and we have only had a week in between. Uh, according to the UNHCR, there are 2.9 Ukrainian million Ukrainian refugees displaced by the war since the 24th of February uh, this year. Majority of them has crossed uh, to Poland, uh, which now hosts 1.8 million refugees. Uh, that's being uh, evidenced by the number of people who cross the border. But as you can see on this map, uh, the Schengen area, which is here marked by the sort of blue lines, is open. The borders are open, which means we cannot say how many of those 1. million are still in Poland and how many have left to other uh, neighboring states. Romania has so far accepted 450,000 refugees. Moldova 330,000, Hungary 260,000, and Slovakia uh, 213,000. Moldova, with a population of 4 million accepted Ukrainian refugees that are at the moment worth of 8% of its population. Uh, I would like to uh, now introduce the panelists, the panelists from the region who are experts on migration and displacement to share with us their reactions on this, um, on this population movement, on this displacement, and the immediate uh, uh, responses to it. So uh, my first uh, uh, guest is uh, Dr. Karolina Łukasiewicz. Uh, uh, she received her PhD from Jagiellonian University. We actually share the same alma mater. After postdocs at the Agilonian and the Institute of Poverty Policy and Research at New York University, she is now based 
at the uh, Center for Migration Research at Warsaw University, where she is a PI on Mary Skłodowska Curie Action Grant, which is part of Horizon 2020. And it's amazing to have her here because her project looks exactly at the migration governments uh, of um, uh, at the level of Central and Eastern European cities post in a, in a context of post 2015 uh, migration situation in Central and Eastern Europe. She has been super busy currently organizing various seminars about the responses to the Ukrainian displacement by various uh, Polish cities. And I will link some of them in the chat for you to watch and to follow up further, uh, especially if you speak Polish, that can be very useful. My second speaker is Dr. Olena Fieduk, and she is a Mary Skłodowska Kiwi Action International Fellow in a Project Rights Lab towards transnational labor rights uh, temporary work agencies and third country national workers in the EU, which is currently based at the University of Padua. However, Olena is uh, joining us from uh, Budapest, where at the Central European University, she has received her PhD at the Department of Sociology and Social Anthropology. And again, I'm super grateful to have her here because her work in uh, focuses on transnational migration, social reproduction of work, uh, gendered employment in migration, as well as solidarity and networks of support in migration. So for me, it's really, it, it, she's really the person to go to, to talk about the responses to the current humanitarian crisis. But Elena also, Olena also specializes in qualitative methodology and for instance, 2018, she credited an important IMISCO uh, volume on qualitative research in European migration studies. So uh, it's an open access, so do check it out. Uh, um, my third panelist today is uh, Frank Duvel, who is a senior researcher at the Institute for Migration Research and Intercultural Studies at Osnabrück University, where he has a consortium on forced migration and refugee research. And Frank Shirley requires no introduction. For many years, he was an associate professor at Compass at Oxford, so the Center for Migration Policy and Society, where he held numerous research projects focusing on Eastern European migration patterns and migration system, including you imagine about migrant aspirations of Ukrainians. He also established the IMISCO Migration Research Hub as part of the Cross Migration Project, and uh, recently he was the PI on the DM project funded by the mm, uh, ESRC in the UK, focusing on the everyday enforcement of the immigration law in the context of the British hostile environment. Uh, Jana Leontieva, uh, she's the head of the department of the Czech Social Science Data Archive, which is part of the Institute of Sociology of the Czech Academy of Sciences. She received PhD from Charles University in Prague and specializes in international migration and minority studies with focus on Eastern Europe and Czech Republic in particular. Uh, and apart from her many publications, she also is active in the policy realm. She's a member of the monitoring committee of the National Program of Asylum, Migration and Integration Fund in uh, Czech Republic. And since 2021, she's a member of the Prague City Council Committee of the, for the integration of foreigners. So again, because of her dual hats, the policy and the academic, she is likely to have the most recent uh, insights and data. And last but, but not least, I am, it's my utmost pleasure to welcome Katarina Ivashenko Stadny, who is a research, senior research fellow at the Institute of Sociology, National Academy of Sciences in Ukraine, where she is preparing her habilitation on youth and forced displacement, issues of adaptation and integration. I have been working closely with Katya, many of us had uh, back in the Oxford times when she was a Ukrainian partner on the project Themis, focusing on the theorizing migration patterns from uh, Ukraine to four European countries, Norway, Netherlands, Portugal, and the UK. But Katya has also been working with colleagues at the Karim East project at the European Research Institute in Florence. And she has been writing on the Ukrainian displacement for a really long time now. And you can check her most, uh, um, one of the recent publications. Uh, 
entitled The Social Challenge of Internal Displacement in Ukraine, the Host Community's Perspective. And that was uh, in the immediate aftermath of the 2014 uh, conflict in the east of Ukraine and the annexation of Crimea by Russia, uh, which is a prelude to the displacement we are observing now, albeit uh, on a completely different scale. So the format of the panel is twofold. First, I would like our speakers to start by presenting the situation so-called on the ground uh, with Ukrainian refugees and from the countries which they join us from. I would like Karolina to start with Poland, then I will give the voice to Olena presenting on the situation in Hungary, Frank in Germany, Jana in Czech Republic, and I would like Katia to speak about the IDP still in Ukraine and their migration, further migration potential. Aside from the immediate humanitarian efforts, I would like you to ponder on the legal situation around the, for instance, implementation of the temporary protection directive. And I would like to give you each approximately eight minutes. That will be our first round. And in the second round of the conversation, I would like us to perhaps take a step back and put the Ukrainian refugee situation in context. Is it fair to say that this is not the first refugee crisis we see in Europe? What are the similarities and what are the differences? And is it even justified to talk about similarities and differences? And I'll be very happy to hear your critical comments. Finally, what is the role of age, gender and race in the discursive construction of this current Ukrainian refugee displacement? So that's as far as the program of today is concerned. I'm going to now stop sharing the screen so you can see my participants fully. And first, I would like to give the voice to Carolina. Thank you. Thank you very much, Agnieszka. Thank you for organizing uh, this event uh, and giving me an opportunity to present the current situation uh, in Poland. Um, so first of all, before I go into details, uh, like you said, uh, uh, Polish-Ukrainian borders has been crossed by over 1.8 million people and uh, this, this is an unprecedented crisis in its scale and also pace which uh, unfolds in modern European and definitely Polish history um, and we need to keep that in mind when looking also critically at what is currently uh, happening in Poland. Um, so, so the the last two or actually now uh, three weeks um, of the crisis and the response of um, um, of of Polish government, local communities was largely grassroots led, volunteer based, and uh, uh, support by local rather than central administration and the central government until very recently has been more like an absent actor uh, in the response or the response was insufficient um, and let me go over like different uh, areas so i'll start with the housing so most of the people um, who uh, has been either shortly or are still uh, in poland crossing the ukrainian borders um, has has been housed in private apartments around the country. Um, we don't have a systematic data on the number of people being housed in the private apartments, but that's like the major um, major response. Increasingly, increasingly, local government and also um, voivods, which are uh, representatives of the central government, are opening bigger uh, reception centers. But the centers are, again, um, largely volunteer run. Uh, what else? Um, uh, train, bus, uh, train or bus stations around the country are uh, are housing refugees as well. You will you will see uh, around the country in all big cities people sleeping on the um, on the floor in uh, in the bus stations, uh, and the situation is increasingly going out of control, also by the local governments. Um, uh, relocation wise. So since the very beginning of the con conflict and uh, um, refugees fleeing from Ukrainian uh, to Poland, uh, 
mainly volunteers uh, drove their private cars to the border and were bringing in people to different parts of the country, including to their private, uh, private houses. Uh, increasingly, local government steps in, bringing uh, train transportation from different parts of the country to the uh, cities at the Polish-Ukrainian um, border. But it's not. Uh, but it's uh, difficult to coordinate. I will go into details in a second. Uh, there are also international actors stepping in, such as UNHCR, which is trying to develop a response plan and funding uh, NGOs, but the uh, UNHCR role, um, also co coordinating role, um, includes developing um, a, a kind of alternative uh, system of supporting refugees, which is rather NGO than um, public administration run. And now in terms of a legal framework, so we took the central government two weeks to finally this Saturday introduce a new law uh, related to accepting, um, accepting refugees from Ukraine in, uh, in Poland. Unfortunately, this new law narrowed down significantly the EU directive on temporary protection to only people who hold Ukrainian passports, so Ukrainian citizen, citizen and flying, people fleeing directly through the Polish-Ukrainian border. So as you can, can you as you can imagine, both both of these components are very problematic uh, because many people um, at some point they were days long waiting lines on Polish Ukrainian border crossing. So people were trying uh, all other options through um, uh, through Slovakia or Romania and then going to Poland. So now they, they, they are in a difficult position, not to mention family members of people who don't have a hold Ukrainian or family members of Ukrainian passport, passport holders that will also not be protected by the current law. And so this narrow category of people will be uh, receiving 18, mon 18 months protection, uh, including access to the labor market, healthcare, um, education system, social services, on the same legal condition as Polish citizens, but as we, of course, know people are not in the same situation as Polish citizen in terms of uh, knowing language, knowing the reality, uh, and, and so on. Uh, so, and there will also be with the new law compensation for housing of refugees. So this is like the broad picture and now in a few words how it actually operates on the ground where there, uh, there are much more uh, issues. Uh, so the current media and political discourse is dominated by the appreciation of the Polish society uh, response, but this response is getting more and more uh, problematic. Uh, so first of all, there is no control over such a volunteer, ride, uh, volunteer run system. Uh, the system is not always efficient, as you can imagine bringing private car to drive several people around the country is not as efficient as organizing train or bus transportation. Um, there is also no control over this volunteer based relocation mechanism. Um, refugees get a little protection when being transported in such a way. And as a result, there are increased reports of financial abuse, sexual harassment, rapes, and human trafficking that, uh, that happens. And um, uh, Helsinki Human Rights Foundation is just preparing a report on, on that abuses after doing a monitoring on the border crossings. And the same, the same is, uh, the same is with the housing situation. Um, only hosts get the money for hosting refugees. So refugees themselves are entirely dependent on the goodwill of the uh, of the Polish uh, um, of people hosting them, uh, and that of course puts them in a very vo vulnerable position for different types of uh, abuses. And looking more broadly, such volunteer run support um, is problematic also. Uh, so of course people everybody or many people have good intentions but they not but they are often not trained because there is not a training system 
there's no coordination system and not uh, no training system. Um, there are multiple examples of uh, I don't know people posting um, on uh, social media. Hey, we need uh, I don't know sleeping bags, and then uh, um, in a few hours they are overflowed with sleeping bags that nobody knows what to, what to do with, and that's true for any kind of good drives uh, actually around the country. Uh, at the same time, people who are volunteering in this reception center at the uh, train or bus stations, they are uh, they are overworked. They work long hours, long shifts. They get burned out quickly. Um, and there is a high, as a result, volunteer turnover, which, which you can imagine. And on the side of local administration, as I mentioned, big Polish cities report not being able to, to accommodate any more uh, such numbers. Just think for a second, my, my hometown of Kraków, which has 780,000 population of people, just a couple of days ago reported hosting 100,000 people. And that within uh, just, uh, just two weeks. So it's at 12% of the city's population. Uh, Warsaw with 1.7 million people reported um, uh, some 300,000 refugees, some of them uh, around 100,000 left, still 200,000 uh, are there. So cities are missing funding, they are missing information on how to, how to coordinate this effort, and, uh, and they still take lead on the relocation with bringing trains, for instance, to, uh, to the bordering towns, but then uh, uh, they have there are tension between central and level government administration. Well, well, uh, where local level uh, administration would inform, uh, would it form um, central level like voivod uh, in these border regions? So we are bringing the train. Can you please prepare people? And it often happens that there is no response. They arrive with like a train that can uh, transport um, four hundred uh, or two three hundred people, and there. There is, uh, there is a crowd, but the crowd uh, of refugees, people don't know where are they being taken, they don't understand Polish geography, and it's like a co complete uh, chaos uh, taking place there. So in some, in the current situation, coordinated, coordination is something which is critically, uh, critically missing, and it um, and it has to be the central government that needs to step in. The information uh, is, uh, is still insufficient for refugees to really understand, even though multiple websites are being set up by local central government, multilingual, that's all. Uh, all new, there are multilingual uh, reception centers at the bus and train station, um, but it's uh, but it's still not. Uh, people don't understand entirely Polish geography. They don't know what are their opportunities if they stay in Warsaw or Krakow versus go to some uh, smaller towns. Um, and also, finally, the the current legal. Uh, system that uh, has been constructed by the central government is extremely problematic by creating this more and less deserving refugees so like more deserving being the ukrainian passport holders less deserving not being uh, uh, not holding the ukrainian passport and that's uh, that's just like the, the the beginning not to mention um other distinction uh, uh in terms of different groups of refugees but i i can talk about it sometime later thank you Thank you so very much, Carolina, for this very, very, you know, holistic and detailed presentation of, of yes, of how much, uh, how much a volunteer run system, uh, yeah, how, what, what are the ins and ends of it? Like, I, I know the, the Poland thing for the first time in seven years has a good press because of the drive to, to help, and yet it comes with a, with a, with a, we, yeah, with, with a side that uh, many of those news headlines are missing, 
which is the, the burnout of the local population. The fact that, you know, you, you, the, the quick turnout means that people are not trained and, you know, we are relearning the same things over and over again. Okay, I'm not gonna repeat what you just said because you said it excellently and there is nothing to add. But I just wanted, before I give the floor to Olena, I just wanted to say that um, to our participants that there is the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom. And if during the talk of any of our presenters, you think there is a the question you would like to you would like ask to uh, our, my panelists to ask at the end please put your question there and uh, we will be monitoring the question and respond uh, at the end of the panel so without further ado olena please uh, uh, tell us about the situation in hungary uh, yes, hi. Uh, thank you so much for having me on this panel. Um, and uh, thank you so much, Carolina, for uh, starting this conversation. I think um, a lot of responses that you have listed uh, um, would be very, very similar to the situation in Hungary as well. Um, I just wanted to start by saying that uh, there are five uh, border crossings with, uh, with Hungary uh, from Ukraine. Some of them are um, uh, made for walking. You can walk over. Some of them are made for uh, passing with the car. There are train um, um, border crossings, and I think um, it is important to talk when we talk about the, uh, you know, when we talk about the flow of people. It is important to discuss about uh, in this situation about the physical space and the means of transport and how. Uh, how much it determines the way the border is crossed and how much it determines the way um, this border crossing is experienced uh, on individual um, level. Um, so in terms of uh, um, in terms of the legal responses, um, I have uh, not so much familiarity with this, so I won't be able to give such a thorough picture as Carolina did. But uh, Hungary has also adjusted its uh, reception laws. And, um, and also um, now there is this possibility to ask for 30 day temporary protection uh, status, which uh, grants accommodation and uh, right to work and uh, social protection and uh, health um, benefits. But um, um, it, it has the same limitations as Carolina was mentioning, so that the role of the third country uh, of, of non-Ukrainian citizens and those people who were without the refugee status in, in Ukraine have been reconsidered. So um, by, the, by the evaluation of, for example, Helsinki uh, group in Hungary, there seems to be a considered push uh, or kind of a pressure on uh, non-Ukrainian uh, non citizens to basically move on. Um, they also can get uh, access to the visa, a 30 day long uh, visa uh, and the right to stay, but they don't, uh, and accommodation, but they don't get, uh, for example, the right to work uh, and other uh, package of um, protection. Um, and also what is also relevant for, uh, for Hungary is that there is a considerable um, Hungarian ethnic community in, in Ukraine, in Transcarpathia. So um, these people are the ones who usually um, have dual citizenship and already have uh, Hungarian citizenship, but provisions for them have been also reconsidered uh, in, in the sense that uh, the government uh, takes the stance so that uh, these people, even though they have a Hungarian citizenship, they, ha they should have um, access to the support that other Ukrainians would be given under the, um, under the temporary protection status. But there is no description yet exactly how can they access this support uh, or what are exactly practical mechanisms for them to access in this support. Um, I think uh, in Hungarian situation, it is, um, I mean, probably most of you know how the government responded to the war um, in Ukraine and um, on, on a larger geopolitical, uh, in a larger geopolitical debate. And I think in terms of Hungary, it is also very important to keep in mind that uh, in the beginning of April, we have elections. And the current um, you know, party uh, leading uh, party, Fidesz, uh, with uh, the um, 
uh, you know, <clears throat> they are they are feeling a lot of uh, they're feeling a lot of pressure, and they're very very careful now how to um, make the right uh, move and how to make the right step, uh, because um, throughout their political history in Hungary they've been relying very heavily on the um, um, you know, on the votes of um, ethnic Hungarians uh, in the neighboring countries. So this is just the background. And in terms of the immediate response, um, I just wanted to say that uh, it is very similar to uh, what Carolina has described. Besides, uh, except for <clears throat> there is a, um, a centralized response from the disaster management uh, um, uh, body, which is called the disaster management, uh, who actually uh, also is present um, at the two train stations in Budapest, for example, where all the trains are uh, re re rerouted. <clears throat> and they have taken the role of providing um, more organized accommodation. In the beginning on the first days, it was provided in Budapest, but then uh, they started spreading out across the country. And the situation is very similar to what Carolina describes that when people arrive and they need an accommodation, they have a buses, they have buses and transportation to this accommodation, but even the service doesn't know exactly which accommodation they will have to take people to because places fill up quite quickly. So there is a lot of reluctance uh, to um, use this service, especially if it's outside of uh, Budapest. Um, in terms of the organizations uh, of, uh, of support that, um, that uh, uh, responded most visibly uh, to, to influx of Ukrainians, um, I would say that there were religious groups and the kind of classical charity like the Maltese and the Caritas. Um, so they have been present uh, in terms of uh, uh, immediate relief on the train stations, also the border crossings, and also with their partners on the Ukrainian border, uh, across the Ukrainian border. Um, so local Ukrainian minority government uh, tried to create some kind of a coherent response, endless variations of self-organized groups uh, by interests and affiliations and identity markings, um, you know, uh, expats, ethnic groups, uh, academic groups, politically politically organized groups. Um, a lot of response came from the countryside as well. Uh, so it's not only Budapest, but uh, from what we uh, from what I hear, is a lot of um, smaller towns and villages have organized themselves in terms of taking um, uh, trips to the border, helping people um, get to their place, organizing humanitarian relief, um, uh, collecting money, collecting donations. Um, and organizing accommodations, obviously. Um, so a lot of these uh, networks sprung from the workplaces, which I think is uh, also really interesting. And we see also that some businesses and companies are joining uh, in this uh, as well. So um, some bigger companies, insurance companies, catering, uh, food catering companies are providing uh, volunteering hours or spaces for hosting people medical center, dentists, uh, so a lot of professional um, kind of um, uh, uh, networks sprang into, into action. In terms of types of activities, again, uh, similar to what Carolina was mentioning, providing accommodation, supplies, transportation, collecting money, collecting um, donations, volunteering time, lots of lots of individuals volunteering time, um, coming to the train stations, helping to buy tickets, helping to find um, to find uh, accommodation. Um, a lot of people are trying to organize this information to take uh, on themselves, this organization group, creating kind of coherent Google uh, sheets, a list of accommodations, creating platform websites where people can post uh, available accommodation and um, post the requests. So a lot of these things we see happening. And in terms of needs, and I'm going to round up here, I just wanted to say that um, what we see in Hungary is a very interesting, um, well, not interesting, but a very fascinating activation of people's individual uh, networks and social capital. Because, um, of course, well, what we haven't uh, discussed is that uh, before the war broke off, on the average, um, 
3 million, uh, up to 3 million Ukrainians have been uh, estimated to be working abroad at any given time. Um, and obviously Ukraine has uh, a very long and very um, geographically fascinating history of labor migration since 1991. So in this crisis, it became very, very obvious that these networks became extremely mobilized. And uh, what I uh, personally saw while um, volunteering just uh, um, in the past couple of weeks on the train station is that most people are coming here to Hungary already having in mind the plan where to go on. Um, they all have some sort of personal connections and networks and um, Maybe this is just the first wave. Again, we need to discuss this. Who was able to get on the move first? Who has the resources to be able to move? Um, possibilities. Um, um, so we can we can talk about this as well. But these are the people who are arri arriving already having a further destination in their mind. And in terms of their needs, a lot of people would need to help with buying further tickets uh, to travel on find an accommodation for a couple of days to regroup, to figure out how to travel the cheapest way, or also to make decisions about where to travel. Because I think that here we see what um, many of us have seen uh, looking into different um, uh, refugee networks and refugee uh, movements around the world when people have to make uh, very important life-changing life decisions very fast. So there is a lot of kind of juggling um, with uh, possibilities going on. People changing minds, uh, people uh, trying to figure out what would be the best route. Okay, I stop here, thank you. Thank you very, very much, Olena, for this uh, really exhaustive uh, picture already with some insights. I think that the role of the networks that were established during the uh, one of the most prolific labor migration of Ukrainians to the West, I remember, uh, Frank's paper once calling Ukraine Europe's Mexico would uh, it's 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 impossible that those networks will not play a role now during the during the humanitarian crisis so thank you so much for bringing this this in uh, now I mean having picked up on Frank I'm going to give him the floor and uh, uh, start sort of this the, the 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 next part of the panel so the talking about people um, talking about situations from countries which are not bordering ukraine immediately but due to the open schengen borders are likely to receive the the the, the refugees what's the response there and uh, whether this sort of um, i would say legal uh, um, uncertainties which we saw in the polish case meaning that if somebody crossed via the a Romanian border or came to Poland via Moldova, they suddenly cannot apply for protection or have a second category status. Whether, yeah, how this, whether Germany at all, I mean, yeah, it's probably not going to play a role there because there's no way to come to Germany directly. So uh, the floor is your friend. Uh, sorry, you need to unmute yourself, friend. Sorry, thanks Agnieszka and uh, thanks for the invitation and uh, please give me a sign if I'm running out of time because I only scribbled uh, very quickly a couple of notes here to focus on uh, what I find is sort of most relevant for this first round. I want to start with uh, sort of saying that back in November, December, Irina Lapshina and I produced the first report scenarios of an invasion, scenarios of uh, displacement. The biggest uh, frustration was that we were right uh, and that the worst case scenario is the reality that we now uh, have. Uh, the purpose then was basically to warn uh, the public to wake up Europe. And honestly, at that time, I wanted uh, the EU, NATO, whoever, to send uh, troops, soldiers, white helmets, uh, blue helmets, whatsoever, anything. I would have appreciated. And also, I wanted to warn the public for what's going to happen to set up a um, reception uh, 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 regime, because that was one of the major failures in 2015 when we saw the humanitarian crisis on the Greek islands and on the Balkans, because there was no evacuation, the borders was closed, all was irregular, there was nothing. 
So I basically wanted the authorities to be prepared. The second major frustration was that nobody wanted to know, nobody wanted to listen. There was zero interest. I wrote to various outlets, they all rejected the paper without any justification except the one. And um, now to the next point, from our sort of you mentioned project way back, we already found then 50% of Ukrainians had a migration aspiration. This is a mere theory, it's a dream, it's an idea, it doesn't materialize, but maybe it's more relevant uh, to recall that uh, Germany was already considered the most attractive um, destination. So what we've got now, after 30 years of um, Ukrainian migration, is a nation that's very well integrated with the EU from below. So we have integration from below, and that means that we have about 250,000 Ukrainians in, um, in Germany who provide a major migration network. Many of them are couples, of course, but if every one of these takes in just two Ukrainian displaced persons, we already have half a million. I consider it much more realistic uh, that we are soon going to get one, if not two million uh, Ukrainians in Germany. But I don't tell anybody. I don't make this public. I don't want to raise any undue alarm. This is almost between us and our hopefully British audience. Not too many Germans, I hope. Uh, we already have 800,000 Syrians and 1 million other refugees, quite a lot, and still Germany continues to be quite welcoming. And this is maybe sort of worth noting. At the moment, there are 160,000 registered Ukrainian refugees, or I rather say displaced persons in, in, in Germany, but probably many more are unregistered. So let's consider there is at least 200,000 already. Many are just on a 90-day visa-free stay. They don't yet register. Many don't know for how long they are going to be here. I talked to very few people back in Ukraine at the border in Poland on the train and in Germany. They rather say we are planning for two weeks, two months, three months. So it's a very short-term perspective. Things are very dynamic and people respond very flexibly. There are about 12,000 arrivals every day from Poland. There is absolutely no numbers about people coming through Romania, Hungary, Czech um, Republic. Uh, most arrive by train. There are extra trains. Um, it's about nine additional trains every day from Poland, plus the eight regular trains going towards uh, Dresden, going towards Berlin, and then on. And another 3,000 arrive by buses. How many arrive self-organized fashion by uh, vans or by cars? Uh, we don't uh, know. Train tickets are free. Uh, and uh, so numbers are increasing every day, 12,000, uh, probably more, 15,000 a day. Uh, what about the legal situation? We have the temporary protection directive, but it's completely unclear uh, how that will be implemented. Uh, there are so many question marks. People do not yet get any official document. They get all sorts of funny documents in uh, funny colors, giving them some funny statuses because the authorities are not ready. They don't have these documents. Second major question is employment. Uh, they have, by the EU directive, uh, access to self-employment, but not to uh, sort of dependent employment. You can only find a common saying, it will be uh, interpreted generously, suggesting that there could be access to employment but it's completely unclear whether it's automatic, whether they need to apply, whether there is a quota, 
whether it's the employers applying uh, or whether it's um, the displaced uh, Ukrainians applying major questions. The same for schools and kindergartens. There is uh, compulsory education. There is a general right to send uh, the little ones to the uh, kindergarten. And what we hear so far is that this is going to be implemented. Uh, I tell everybody asking these questions, we need to be patient. Uh, we are in the third uh, week of the war. Uh, don't be over demanding, don't be over critical. There are lots and lots of challenges, lots and lots of uh, complications. We will be getting there, but it's very important uh, for academics to maintain certain pressure and to insist in the highest possible level of protection, uh, which includes uh, the right to work, education, healthcare, uh, benefits. But also a certain issue is the question of uh, like self-selected choice of destination versus compulsory dispersal. Compulsory dispersal is extremely controversial because uh, it deprives uh, people of their agency and it undermines community links and family links and all the rest of it. So there are two issues here. And at the moment, this is what we see in practice. People who've got somewhere to go, people who've got a whole semi family uh, are allowed to go there by their own choice, but people who are staying in some horrid uh, gym or uh, airport or convention hall uh, are probably going to be dispersed according to the capacities of municipalities and cities across uh, Germany. But this is something that's got to be monitored. How many Ukrainians are hosted privately? I don't know. My initial suggestion is that a few hundred thousand will eventually be hosted privately, but a few hundred thousand, if not millions, depends on how many come, will need to be accommodated uh, through some city municipality structure. What we see is that not only the Ukrainians host uh, displaced persons from Ukraine, there is a very high level of solidarity from uh, Germans. We get telephone calls from people I haven't heard of for 10 years offering accommodation. We also notice that uh, the Polish people in Germany, and there is about a million, are often willing to host the Ukrainians in Germany. Then we have the so-called ethnic Germans uh, from Russia. So they are very often Russian speakers. It's a very divided community. You have the Putinists on the one hand, the older generation, but also you have the younger generation who are much more hospitable, in particular those uh, in these sort of smaller independent churches. And they all organize solidarity events and they host uh, Ukrainians. In what numbers, I don't know, but we have it in our own community, friends, my secretary, they all offer and practically take on Ukrainian. So there is a, I think, significant social capacity to host Ukrainians, but the big question mark is for how long? So we talk about a very dynamic situation Maybe it will change in three months. Uh, maybe there is some kind of, some sort of um, agreement, very difficult uh, to imagine, but this is what we hope for. Uh, but there is also the opportunity that people can't go back because they don't want to live under Russian boots. People can't go back because the economy is destroyed. The supermarkets are destroyed. The houses are destroyed. So um, we, discuss then durable solutions. Uh, it's completely up in the air 
I think we need to talk about it. We need to be prepared for all scenarios whilst maintaining some uh, optimism. I think I Thank leave you. it there. Thank you so much, Frank. Sorry, I think, uh, sorry for cutting in. But I think we were on the right, I mean, uh, at the same level, I just wanted to say that the, uh, lots of the things you mentioned, like, uh, for instance, work, uh, the ability to work uh, in the convention system as being uh, something immediately denied to asylum seekers. Now it's becoming part of the solution under this temporary protection directive. So, uh, uh, and, and it has been, it has been uh, I mean, the, the, the situation how the right to work has intersected with the asylum system from yet before the Second World War, then to, towards the different schemes that emerged before the convention took place in, I mean, to Cruz in 1951, demonstrates that there's this a little bit of very, I mean, ambiguous relationship between from international protection and the and the uh, and the accommodation of refugees, but also yeah, the choice of movement is very important. Uh, Jana, without further ado, how the situation looks like in Czech Republic? Yeah, thank you for inviting me to this seminar. I'm glad to participate. Before I uh, talk about the Czech context, I would like to remind, uh, or probably some of uh, you uh, don't know, uh, the results of the, uh, the public opinion survey uh, conducted by Cape International uh, Institute of Sociology in, the mid, in mid February, actually, or in the beginning of February, uh, where when um, the question, uh, the respondents were asked the question in the event of an armed intervention by Russia in your city or village, would you take any action? And if yes, which ones? And that there were multiple, uh, there were mm, multiple um, choice. Uh, 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 it was a multiple choice question. Uh, but uh, when when you look at the results and they uh, they compare, uh, they had those uh, questions added uh, back in December, and then in February, in in the beginning of February. And uh, what actually the basic results was that uh, during that two months, the uh, the the will to resist either to put up an armed resistance or to resist by participation in civil resistance increased. And it used to be in February, uh, of course it's declared, but still it used to be uh, uh, 58%. And one of the strategy was to go, uh, men uh, mentioned in this question was to go abroad. And contrary wise, uh, uh, unlike the will to resist here, at least declared will to go abroad in case of this conflict, uh, it uh, uh, was a, a bit a bit uh, uh, smaller than it used to be in December. So uh, by the, the latest um, the latest survey, it was seven uh, seven and a half percent of the population. Of course, something declared before before the uh, uh, actual invasion and what happened afterwards. But we know and we have to also I think mention here that uh, many of people who declared their will to go abroad just cannot go abroad. And it's not only in case of men, but also in case of families who decided that they, they, they don't want to be separated. So I think that it's something which has to be uh, stated here because in context what Frank mentions that like migration aspiration is very important for Ukrainian population. So I think it's it's useful to, to mention. So in, in case of Czech context, Czech Republic was uh, quite a quite a, uh, popular destination for many Ukrainians. And actually in terms of the country, uh, Ukrainian migration was the largest, at least when it comes to the numbers. Of course, Slovaks, uh, Slovaks are, uh, are uh, not, uh, many of them are not registered in official statistics, but still it, it's the highest migration, migration group. And uh, uh, in, the, uh, um, in the beginning of, uh, of uh, 2022, there were 200,000 Ukrainian citizens living in the Czech Republic. And in response to this Russian invasion in Ukraine, uh, a Ministry of Interior um, they issued uh, uh, the new type of long-term visa, which is which is uh, which is provided on on spot. Uh, the special long-term visa for like tolerance visa. It's valid for a year. It gives you. Uh, it, it has many advantages, even comparing to, for example, re re uh, family reunification visa because it's not only gives you the access to the labor market, but uh, actually it also gives you very important access to the healthcare, 
uh, because there are two, uh, two health, uh, health insurance scheme. One of them are not covering all the services like so commercial insurance scheme, uh, which is also for students, for many family members, and for those uh, who for self-employed, for example, and for for new, for those Ukrainian refugees, uh, new type of visa allows them to enter a so-called public insurance scheme, which actually actually gives you full coverage of health of health services, uh, which I think is a quite important uh, important step. Um, uh, well, when it comes to the uh, Ministry of, because I mentioned that this special type of visa is uh, uh, actually very fast procedure at the regional center and uh, it's actually issued on a spot. Uh, you, you got a stamp, there was a sticker in the visa, they ran out of the stickers, uh, so they now give you only a stamp. And this stamp is uh, valid still the, 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 the moment you leave the office. And uh, as for as of today, there are 100, uh, six, uh, 158,000 Ukrainian citizens uh, who already got this type of visa. Uh, uh, one third of them are male, uh, two thirds are female, 36% are children up to 15 uh, years of age, and only, few, uh, only 3% are elderly people. So there was also discussion because of this access to the public insurance, like how how much those refugees will be a burden to the to the welfare, and even there is a discussion from from the association of insurance company that this is not the the most risky group because there are only few elderly people, and I think that it's really uh, what's happening now. It's hard to compare with anything uh, Czech Republic faced before. Uh, because even even in the, the so-called migration crisis, there were no refugees in the Czech Republic at all. There were media discourse, very very uh, very anti-migration attitudes, uh, but uh, actually there were no refugees in the Czech Republic. Uh, and now uh, the, the country actually the number number of Ukrainians almost doubled in three weeks. And uh, here is a huge challenge for society. And, uh, and actually, I, I also observed the change of the discourses, of media discourses, even the change uh, in the attitudes towards NGOs, because I was working with NGOs who were assisting immigrants, assisting refugees, and they really, there was a hate campaign against them. And now there's a huge solidarity, uh, which I'm very thankful to, to Czechs. And there's a very, very strong support, a lot of volunteers, Actually, now uh, so many databases providing uh, the services, the, the accommodation, uh, so that uh, many NGOs call for better coordination, right? Because sometimes uh, Czech Republic does doesn't have the immediate border with Ukraine, so uh, mostly we have to keep in mind those trans transnational families. So probably, as Elena mentioned, who are those who who uh, who came here for in, in the first wave? In most of the cases, I think we don't have statistics, we don't have research yet, but I think that are those who already had some ties to the Czech Republic, have some family members, some close relatives, some friends here, and also Czech volunteers who wanted to provide the help, they were traveling to pick up refugees on the Slovak border and uh, to the less extent to the Polish border. So in those statistics you, you, you saw on the map, crossings from Slovak's Republic, there were also Ukrainians picked up by Czech volunteers and brought to the Czech Republic. Of course, uh, already mentioned by Karolina as well, the burnout of those volunteers and many NGOs, professional NGOs providing assistance, they're warning um, and they provide uh, some, some kind of guidance for those volunteers providing help. What can they, like how to, how to behave in, in in promising your assistance, because of course, if you take uh, under your roof someone with no connections, with no knowledge of language, it's not only the roof you are providing, you are providing all the ser services and people become dependent on you. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the uh, law changes, uh, there, there, is this, uh, there is a discussion and we, 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 we hope there will be uh, 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 more changes soon. And uh, that talk, uh, the talks about and discussions about the uh, the uh, um, support for uh, those who accommodate ref refugees. Uh, there, there's a very, very uh, strong uh, attempts now to uh, um, to help with the, with integrating migrant children 
into the educational systems. There were Ukrainian radio, there were Ukrainian groups, uh, several schools already started a special Ukrainian uh, class, uh, mixed age. And uh, there, there's also a lot of discussion how to accommodate uh, those, um, those uh, like uh, existing, existing instruments in the educational system for, uh, for uh, pupils and children without uh, uh, sufficient knowledge of uh, Czech as a language of instruction. Uh, of course, we uh, like exceptional and very, 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 very uh, vivid here, the strong role of NGOs, as I already mentioned, who are providing services and lobbying and like coordinating and without NGOs, I think the system will would totally collapse. And um, a lot of talks and discussion about the concentration and the um, like the how, how big cities like Prague and Brno. Uh, central central uh, Czech region around Prague and uh, South Moravian region around Brno, how the, those are concentration points and reaching to their maximum capacities already when it comes to both accommodation and the capacities of volunteers and how to attract uh, uh, migrants to the region. We already mentioned social networks and of course those are the region where Ukrainians are um, concentrated, uh, were concentrated within within last last uh, three decades or two decades uh, i already mentioned access to the labor market access to the to the uh, to the healthcare uh, and already i mentioned uh, already i i i uh, uh, I saw in some media, in, in some political discourse the discussion of the so called absorbing capacities like talking how many refugees can Czech Republic accommodate without uh, without any significant burden to the systems and they're already starting we're already starting seeing numbers like what a million or something like like this which is like uh, not even uh, which is not even double of what is what we have now in the country so uh, i think that's that's uh, i hope i didn't uh, forget anything from my notes this is very shortly the uh, the situation as i see it now and as I see, I think that unprecedented changes are happening in the Czech society as well, in both in terms of accepting foreigners, accepting refugees, uh, discussing refugees, like discussing the uh, attitudes to NGOs and, and many other things. You see the solidarity from the, from the newsstands, from uh, people uh, selling, uh, selling flowers in order to support uh, and raise some money to support Ukraine in, in many, in many, um, in, I don't know, some, some Czech women cooking and uh, learning uh, basic words in Ukrainian so that they can interact with, uh, with, the, with the Ukrainian mothers. And of course, when, I, when we mention also the, uh, by the way, when we mention also the integration to the labor market, as it's often discussed now, and the system allows that, often, uh, often in the discussion, we lost the, the arguments that there are a lot of problematic points when it comes to integration of these Ukrainian refugees into the labor market, not only because there are uh, vulnerable, vulnerable groups and some, some for example, uh, women uh, who don't have, uh, who, for example, have uh, uh, several kids and don't have much uh, experience on the labor market, even back in Ukraine, but also those uh, unfair practices like working, poor working conditions and exploitation and stuff like this. So. So there are a lot of concerns from NGOs also, what would be the conditions for, for employing those people uh, or integrating them in the labor markets. So this is, I think, uh, all from me at this point. Thank you very much, Jana. Thank you very much, Jana. And I also like how through the presentation of yours, of Olena's and of, of Carolina's comes the the strength of the civic society in Central Eastern Europe, because I think we've we've been uh, West Plain, if I can use this uh, neologism, we've been West Plain uh, for many years throughout the post-socialist transition, how uh, our civic society is poor and it's never making it to the same levels as in the West, et cetera. And, and now uh, actually a thing if anything can be said about this crisis, that the civil society is standing up and, and, and passing the test in this really dire humanitarian need. Uh, okay, uh, I'll leave my comments to the, to, the, to the end, but now I would like uh, Katya to speak from Krakow. 
uh, uh, Katya, what is your uh, assessment of the, I mean, you've been working with the IDPs due to the conflict for many years now. How, what is the, 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 what can we say about the new quality of, 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 of the IDPs now and the, 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 pro, the, the projections for the future? How many of those IDPs are actually to happen, uh, to, to, to turn into international okay. refugees? Thank you very much, Agnieszka, for having me. Uh, I should confess that I have only started to collect the data on the internal migration, but I have started my own, let's say, uh, displacement circle, starting from being a survival in Kiev, because uh, my house was hit by the rocket during the third, I think, day of the war. Then I was uh, in Kiev, which was under shelling and attacks for 10 days, I think. Then I fled to Lviv and I was internal, internally displaced person for two days or something. And then finally I fled to Krakow. So it's a kind of combination of insights and, and, and statistics. And statistics, as you probably all know, internal statistics is usually a problem in Ukraine because not all people are registered. And it's quite a very, very, I would say, vague estimation, but still let me as we are running out of time, let me just present a very brief uh, situation overview and also share some thoughts on the, I would say, possible developments in the scope of migration and also this uh, connection of the internal possibilities of internal migrations and risks that they bring to external migration. Because I think that this is kind of very connected processes. Because, you know, it is the first time in the Ukrainian modern history that the whole country is affected by the conflict. Let me just uh, start by saying that Ukraine was not a kind of country with particularly active internal migration. Because internal migration rates were never very high in Ukraine. Although we know, of course, that there was some labor migration from rural area to urban area or to Kiev, which was one of the most modern and flourishing city in the country also very active in terms of new businesses, services, IT business. And of course it was a magnet for labor force in Ukraine. But in any case, the potential of internal migration was never fully utilized before the invasion. And let me call it invasion, which started in 2014. Although, you know, to be honest with you, we have quite intensive talks and discussions with our international partners in UNDP. And I, I, would, name, I would not name them. I will leave them, but let's say, let's say international partners, we had discussions how to call the conflict and we were not allowed to use words aggression, not, not taking Russian aggression. It was just some Ukrainian crisis, timidly, timidly defined, defined as Ukrainian crisis. But let me just start by saying that I, I think I am allowed now as a scientist and as a person, as a Ukrainian citizen to call it invasion which has started in, in 2014. So in 2014, when the uh, first wave of internal uh, displacement took place, and in the long run, in eight years of internal displacement, I would say that this uh, conflict of war-driven displacement in, remained internal. So internal migration prevailed. Most people fled by the war. <clears throat> Most people affected by the war they were displaced within Ukraine, but not outside Ukraine. If you compare this situation to what is happening now, it's very different because the whole country is affected by the conflict. The total number of people affected by war is 12 million and a half. This is estimation of the OCHA. You, you, you probably know the United... I, I, still, I still cite them because they are reliable partners. I just uh, want that they should choose proper words to describe the situation. That's it. So OSHA uh, estimated it as 12 uh, million people affected by the war. Also 30% 30, 30 of people, of population in need of life saving assistance. This is a third of population. And uh, uh, we should also emphasize that lots of lo localities, large localities, highly industrialized cities, are seized, they are locked. For example, Mariupol, which is, it, it's, it's just a humanitarian disaster is happening there. The estimated number of victims, it's, it's unprecedented uh, human uh, loss and, and, and death toll is 
uh, as high as 2,000 and a half already. So it is locked and no humanitarian convoy can be allowed there. And the, la the last humanitarian convoy was actually halted. So they are just, uh, they had no water, no uh, electricity, no, no other energy supplies. They are just locked there and no humanitarian corridor is provided. So let's just consider this situation. Many localities in Ukraine are still locked and people are not allowed to, to flee. So if they are allowed to flee, I, I assume that the, you know, the scope and the scale of internal migration would immediately increase. But as it stands now, two days ago, this is statistics of, uh, I think, March 13th. So the, uh, the number of internally displaced people within this, this phase of uh, aggression is uh, almost 2 million people, 1.9 million people. Still, it's smaller than the external migration. Again, I, I, I should stress, this is for the first time that external migration prevails because situation inside Ukraine is not secure. Of course, you can go to Lviv, but Lviv is under shelling and you never know how it would, would happen. I would also say that probably Poland is not, 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 not the most safe place because, uh, you know, being here in Krakow for, for a week already, I hear this, you know, in discussions that we are we might be under attack, we might be. But in any case, I think, uh, uh, yeah, before before I, I come to the development uh, um, assessments, let's say, I also should share some statistics uh, about the internal trains. Uh, and although this is statistics only for uh, four days from 3rd to 7th of March, it will give you the understanding of the geography and scope of internal migration. So I'll present data on the trains. These are, these are evacuation trains. And if you compare the procedure of getting into trains in Ukraine to the procedure that you colleagues have described, it is different because you don't have any tickets. So people are not registered. So uh, simply when, when I left Kiev, and it was uh, I think it was 5th of uh, March, we, we were just allowed to the carriages without any registration. And that's why it's not quite um, uh, statistically grounded to, to claim that, you know, this number of people have fled Kiev or have fled Kharkiv, because we just, we packed there and we went. So no tickets, no registration, but uh, during these four days, from again, from 3rd to 7th of uh, March, uh, 83 trains uh, went to Lviv, then uh, 68 to Zakarpatia, uh, 24 to Chernivtsi, then Ivano Frankivsk, 22, Chernopilska, Chernopil, 7, and Volinska, again, 7. So Lviv was the main destination. If we take the uh, origin uh, geography, where from these trains went, then Kiev go, goes first. Uh, it's 93 trains. Again, it's evacuation trains with no tickets. People just packed and went. Uh, then it's Lviv, but Lviv went to Poland or to other outside destinations. Uh, then it's Kharkiv, 39, uh, Odessa, 20, 29, and uh, Zaporizhia. Then it was possible, 29 again. This statistics is changing all the time. It can, you can check it. It's available on the OCHA side, also on some of the uh, Ukrainian authorities' sites. But in any case, Again, Lviv remains the main destination so far. But as we know from the, you know, from the reports, from the use, Lviv remains under shelling. And uh, I don't know, I have no, I, I cannot guarantee that people will live there. Probably if they're allowed to go, they will go. Uh, so I think with, with, whole, with this whole, you know, uh, uh, insecurities and risks on the plate with lack of humanitarian corridors, locked places with quite huge number of people. It's large cities, Ukraine is a large country. It's nearly Afghanistan size. So it's nearly 40 million people. And if you take Mariupol, Mariupol is nearly half million people city. It's a large city. And also uh, it's quite a unique place because you know, 25% of the local population have been IDPs already from 2014. 
So again, half a million people are locked now, and it's humanitarian catastrophe. If humanitarian corridor will be in place, I think most of the population will go out of the city and they have to go somewhere. I, I doubt they would go to Kiev. I would say they would try to, to flee. So of course, you know, for the best and specifically for the European Union, it would be much uh, cheaper, forgive me this word, but it would be cheaper to resolve this problem now and to close the sky. Because until the sky is not closed, the whole territory of Ukraine remain unsecure. That means that internal migration is not a choice. It's not a sustainable solution for people. And that means that, you know, this load on other neighboring states, other neighboring countries will increase. And also let me share the final thought. As I have been told with, again, I sorry for sharing this personal information, but sometimes it's like, let's take it as something from the interview. I might have interviewed someone. So I, this is my personal information. I arrived in Lviv on the 5th of March. Uh, it was Sunday. I went to, the, the procedure looks like that. You go to the local um, community, it's territorial community, which, is, which has an office. Uh, I arrived there with all my family, with passports, and we have been registered. So they, they worked over a weekend to register all the arriving, all the displaced people. Then on Monday, I've got a call from the local administration offering me places in the local school. It's not Lviv, it's near Lviv, but in any case, it's um, probably Frank, Frank will, will know the location, Holodnavitka, it's, uh, you probably know that. So I was offered uh, places at school. So I suspect that this is something, this is the remnants of the uh, legal system, which was established after 2014. But these humanitarian capacities are not enough to cope with uh, mounting needs. When it's, uh, let's say, 100 people, they can cope. If it's 1 million, I doubt the, you know, the local infrastructure will sustain. So it's a huge load on the local infrastructure. But in any case, allowing people to remain within Ukraine will be a more sustainable solution because, as the colleagues mentioned already, if you stay in Ukraine, you have your breadwinner with you because men of 18, 60, 65 can remain within Ukraine. If you go outside, you leave your husband behind. You just go with, with your children. So you, are, you, be, you become a breadwinner. And this is... This is a challenge. This is a challenge for a family. This is a challenge for the host community. And this is a challenge for the state. So again, this is something to be resolved now. And this is something that Europe should probably resolve itself before uh, the number of refugees reach the number that Frank uh, actually estimated quite rightly. Because, you know, again, if 12 million people are directly affected by the war, I would say this would be the number of potentially the number of refugees. Again, if the country is destroyed, and this is something that is quite a target for the Russia now, if you see the pictures, this is the target for them to destroy everything, starting from cultural heritage and, and finishing with schools. Uh, already now uh, it's 320 schools are destroyed, just schools not speaking of uh, residential areas, residential buildings, hospitals. This is something to be stopped now. I would probably stop here because we have a discussion ahead of us. Thank you. Thank you so very much, uh, Katya. And thank you very much uh, for uh, zooming on the conflict uh, as, uh, because ultimately this is why we are all here. We are talking about the refugee movement as the direct consequence of the Russian invasion. And the, and the ongoing war. And it's uh, very interesting to hear your thoughts that, it, that it's not about, uh, that, that it's not only very difficult to estimate the internal displacement, but uh, it's also uh, impossible to say because people are actually prevented from fleeing by the lack of the uh, humanitarian corridors. Uh, so, uh, and thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for uh, willing to come here and to also share your story because that's, uh, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, 
we don't know how we would behave if we were in that situation. Thank so thank you very much, Katya. I, I was uh, I'm just slightly mindful of the time. I know we were um, uh, supposed to have also the second round where we sort of take a, a step back and think a little bit more analytically about the conflict. So how about, uh, but I also have been, as there were some really interesting questions that were popping in the Q&A and I know some of you Thank you very much, Carolina, Jan, and Frank, been uh, busy answering those questions. But I also want to acknowledge uh, our uh, audience in being an, an active participant in those uh, in the in the panel today. So now, in the second round, I would like to pose the questions that I posed to you at the beginning. That is, you know, uh, <laughs> I think Jana mentioned it. I mean. Calling it a refugee crisis really brings to mind the 2015, which in Eastern Europe saw literally zero refugees. We were the ones who uh, refused to uh, sign up to the EU solidarity scheme of relocation. Uh, I mean, our governments, and I'm talking here also as a Polish citizen, were actually pivotal in bringing down those or, or, or dismantling those uh, uh, so the, the, the relocation schemes or, or why they ultimately were not so successful. And uh, uh, also we're talking now, uh, uh, next uh, thing is that now the borders are open for the Ukrainians to cross between, you know, Slovakia and Czech Republic from, you know, from Hungary go further north while in the, in the, in the 2015, we actually have, uh, uh, you know, these countries physically putting Walls in place to prevent from further uh, to prevent from further movement. Uh, uh, so I want to I want to find out your uh, reflections on those issues, but also on the issues of you know how di how different the situation now is in terms of like we we've already heard the gender composition. Men are not allowed to leave Ukraine, which means it's primarily women and children who are leaving. Uh, as a result, that sort of really speaks to the discursive construction of an ideal refugee. And maybe that also fuels the different response, which we see now. But also uh, there were questions asked in the, in the, uh, in the chat by uh, uh, Stefania Tanti Monaco, who works for the Statelessness Network, about what happens to actually the stateless people in Ukraine who also are probably fleeing the conflict. Have you come across how they are being accommodated in the different? Hello, Sasha. <laughs> in the different in the different countries. Um, in the different countries we talk about. How about the response to the Roma? Uh, that was a question by Cordula Vondenkowski about, uh, uh, we know Ukraine had a su substantive Roma population. Do we know anything about, about their movement? And then the, the last thing I also want to bring um, uh, for discussion is, is um, uh, the um, started by Dorota Czapko, but also Irina Kuznetsova, Jacqueline Robinson, and Frank uh, commented about the role of the mental health and the research on the mental health, uh, how it um, uh, how, how it's really, really needed, and whether there was anything done in that in that in that area uh, at the moment, or or maybe that's a scope for something we should actually get together and write a project proposal about, because that seemed to be a really neglected issue. But not because maybe it's intentionally neglected, but because there are so many other things that you know. Uh, we are uh, taking to the directions of taking care of. So I'm just putting these things in and you don't have to address all of them, but feel free to pick and choose uh, 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 your uh, your contribution now. And I'm giving uh, Carolina the first voice. Thank you very much. Uh, so, so just uh, very briefly, uh, from, uh, from a Polish perspective, the uh, I think a more relevant point of reference is not the 2015 or 16, but actually um, um, a more relevant point of reference uh, is uh, uh, this summer of uh, 2022. So indeed in the 2015-2016 um, Polish government uh, uh, refused the relocation mechanism and it's a kind of historical irony but uh, at the same time we should remember that back then the, that was not how the majority how the society felt about it 
So uh, the majority of polls uh, back then it, in 2015 has been largely supporting accepting refugees. And it's the um, highly anti-refugee narrative of the government throughout the year and uh, the narrative that was present in public media supported, supporting the government, that's what contributed to changing of, of the attitudes. But why do I refer to the uh, summer of 2022? That's when the crisis at the Polish-Belarusian border started. And this is when the Polish government started building walls and uh, started building up uh, this extremely anti-refugee narrative with um, having have to support uh, our society from, uh, from the way uh, Belarusian government is using the, um, the refugees and so on. Uh, but at the same time, we should remember that the scale of the arrivals uh, was entirely different back then. So, so the, the crisis at the Polish-Belarusian border, which is still ongoing, um, included thousands of people and not millions as it, as it is with the uh, case of, um, of Ukraine. And it's kind of uh, also another, another irony that Polish government was um, since the summer of 2022 using the narrative that we cannot process the asylum claims on the Polish Belarusian borders because our system will not be able to process so many cases. And that was, let me remind you, talking about thousands of people at the border who are still um, winding around in forests and trying to get uh, to uh, to Poland and another uh, and another kind of um, difference uh, compared to the current crisis is of course who the crisis is about and how refugees are racialized in this process and uh, and of course um, the, the the current uh, the the situation with the Ukraine um, and specifically th those groups which are getting protection in Poland are Ukrainian citizens versus uh, citizens of Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Syria, uh, also Central Africa. So uh, often black and brown people who are, uh, who are being uh, refused protection in Poland and separated with the barbed wire. So that's, that's definitely a difference. And there was a question, um, from the audience about the situation of Roma people. So this is actually a very valid question. I, I, um, I regret that uh, our team uh, with, um, with Camila Fiokoska is not here, who is actually about to conduct uh, in the upcoming days uh, a monitoring of the situation of Roma people at the border. And they are leading uh, a project about Roma migrants. Uh, in Europe, uh, so as as from what we know right now, the situation is not good. And as much as uh, people are being rationalized and uh, racialized and um, uh, and picked at the Belarusian border because of their skin color, so this is also what we see at the Polish-Ukrainian border, where different uh, non-profit organization has already been pointing out at unequal treatment of. Uh, uh, of holders of Ukrainian passports versus holders of passports from uh, from other countries, especially um, uh, especially Africa, but also in terms of uh, Roma people, this is clear racial profiling that we hear about, and uh, in the upcoming days we will have more information. And just before I finish, I wanted to refer everyone. In the upcoming days, we will publish a CMR spotlight describing being the local situation in Poland, in Polish and English. So I, I hope we will have a chance to distribute it farther with much more information than what I was able to say today. Thank you, Agnieszka. Thank you so very much, Karina. We will wait for, and I will be happy to distribute the, the spotlight as well. Uh, Olena, final remark. Right. Um, thank you so much, uh, Karolina, for picking up on all those issues. I will tr also try to be brief and I just wanted to pinpoint a couple of things which I think were not mentioned, but I agree with everything that Carolina said um, before. I mean, uh, any kind of a situation of crisis, any kind of a situation, especially of such a uh, tremendous humanitarian disaster uh, scale that we're talking about, 
obviously we have to think here about the intersectionality of uh, vulnerabilities, right? So um, all of these things, all of these uh, uh, experiences of uh, discrimination, um, exclusion, erasing from, you know, slipping through the, the grids of the social supports and networks, all of this obviously become incredibly magnituded through this experience of war and what is happening right now. So I think every kind of an effort on the part of different NGOs and networks to kind of uh, provide extra support to particular kind of vulnerable groups, I think is incredibly welcome and valid, absolutely valid. Um, and very much needed. Uh, what I wanted to add, which I think we haven't really uh, discussed, is the kind of a situation to which uh, these people arrived to Europe. And now we're talking about, uh, well, if we can say post-COVID or in-COVID uh, um, limitations of mobility that been, Europe has been ex experiencing in the last two years. And um, I mean, uh, I'm just still uh, to see and to, to, I would be very interested to engage in a conversation about how much this excitement of Europe um, to kind of um, and readiness, readiness to welcome people is linked to this completely devastated labor markets on which um, Europe in every single sphere is experiencing the lack of uh, workforce and has been experiencing the lack of the workforce linked to limitations of mobility in the, in the COVID times and um, uh, how this will translate into willingness to um, uh, include people uh, in the, in the uh, workforce. And this takes me to a small, um, very small anecdotal evidence that I've seen uh, in Hungary. I saw posters of factories um, uh, advertising jobs for Ukrainians immediately uh, on the spot. So when I um, called them and asked about this job and I started asking this leading up question saying that you understand the type of people who are coming, these are usually women, these are women with their dependents. Do you have any kind of schemes or provisions for them? What will happen to the children or the elderly whom they're bringing along very soon? They were kind of backing up and saying, well, we're just providing a job. We can't provide anything else. We don't know. This, this is not our business. We can't deal with all these things. So I think um, there is a really need to uh, discuss uh, exactly the details of, um, of this social, um, uh, social integration, social reproduction of work, uh, you know, of workers that will happen in this context in, in the receiving countries. And a very quick, um, a very quick uh, notice, a very quick comment on the issues of um, mental health. I think Katerina probably will be able to tell more about this. But there is um, what I see in the official Ukrainian channels, uh, you know, distributed through uh, Telegram and all the social media. There is a lot of um, emphasis and a lot of kind of self-help. Uh, for people um, directed to people who uh, might uh, experience different um, effects of the uh, of the trauma. Um, so there's a lot of infographics which appear. There's a lot of kind of advice. Um, um, there is um, um, uh, there was I think an online uh, uh, therapist psychotherapist group that was created where people could. Um, a hotline where people could refer to. And also we see a similar thing uh, happening in Hungary where very quickly um, mental health specialists have been mobilizing to provide help not only for people arriving, but also for the volunteers. Um, just uh, yesterday, there was an interesting um, uh, workshop organized uh, for people uh, from Ukraine, um, those working with people in, uh, from Ukraine and those working with volunteers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elena. Uh, uh, Frank, the, uh, I mean, I, I, I said I put quite a lot of issues to discuss, but feel free to, to pick the one you feel most comfortable. Yeah, thanks, Agnieszka. There is indeed not only a lot to discuss, there is also some family life in the background. 
and uh, I've only got limited time, I'm afraid. I just published a quick analysis today, uh, Facebook, and people might want to have a look, so I'm not going to talk about that. What um, I really find uh, most annoying is that, well, for many years, if not decades, uh, Western scholarship, not you, but many, neglect what I call the global East. And there is this sort of epistemological bias looking at the world through the concept of the global North and the global South. So you see immediately, where is the East? The East isn't there. There is enormous ignorance of um, matters in the East, migration, forced migration. There is no consciousness uh, about Russia's role as a major driver of displacement. Uh, I mean, I don't mention uh, Hungary in the 1950s and 60s, but look at Afghanistan, uh, the invasion, look at Kyrgyzstan, look at uh, Georgia, look at Transnistria, look at Ossetia, look at the Donbas. There is a very long history and of course, uh, Syria and the, the Russian boats are in Libya, they are in Mali, they are in Sudan, and they play a major, major role in uh, driving global displacement. And we need to highlight that, we need to research that, we need to see the pattern. We also need to much better understand uh, the pattern of uh, Russian warfare, which is warfare against the people. This is what they did in Chechnya, in Syria, and now in, uh, in Ukraine. This is absolutely disgraceful, of course. That's one uh, point uh, I want to raise. And uh, the other point is ignorance about Ukraine. Ukrainians are all blonde and blue-eyed. What a nonsense, what an ignorance. Ukraine, and this is what I always found so fascinating, is a multi-ethnic country, is a multi-religious country. It's extremely diverse for various reasons, hundreds of years of migration and uh, mobility. And all these diverse people are affected uh, the same by the same war, whether it's Jews or whether it's Muslims or Protestants or Catholics or whether it's Romanian, Hungarians, uh, uh, the people who speak Russian, the Ukrainians, all the same. And uh, this kind of diversity on the one hand, and also the European heritage is kind of neglected, ignored for too long. And there is a very cynical, unfortunately, window of opportunity to challenge the ignorance towards the global east and also to challenge the ignorance uh, towards uh, Ukraine. And I think I'll leave it here because there will soon be some rioting in the background. Thank you so very much. Thank you so very much, Frank. I think the point of the global east is well taken. And uh, I think that that, 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 that should di direct, the, let's say, the next, uh, the next research into the migration systems and migration patterns, but also forms of displacement. Uh, Jana? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to pick up the, the single topic to discuss. And I think that the issue is so broad and uh, so rapidly changing that if we are here to discuss the same thing in a week, we can come up to completely uh, different different conclusions, but still, I think that I agree with the, most of the things said by Carolina, Lena, and Frank. And uh, uh, I, I think that for the Czech society in general, this is unprecedented. And this is also a huge challenge, not only in terms of accepting a uh, very large number of Ukrainian refugees, but also the re rethinking their, their way of uh, their attitudes towards refugees, their attitudes, their ignorance, as Frank mentioned, towards, towards, towards Ukraine and towards Global East. And uh, a lot of things, um, a lot of things I see are shifting and changing in the Czech society. And uh, it's hard to it's hard to make any any um, uh, presumptions or or uh, to say how how and how long this uh, how long how long this war uh, is going to continue and what will be the outcomes for both for the Czech society because now there are 
discussions when I was approached by media, if I think that there will be a huge problem with refugees. I was uh, like a two, week, two weeks or something like this ago. Uh, my, my, my answer was like, yes, I think that in case there will be a huge wave of refugees, the refugee crisis will not be the only problem of the Czech society. And this is what's happening now, because they are now discussing how much of the budget will come to the um, to the uh, uh, to the enforce the the army forces to this to the security and so, so other to other things and in this post covid time uh, this situation is itself is calling for uh, for a huge change in minds of many people and uh, and I think that uh, that uh, like I, I see that in so many in so many spheres that it's really hard to to uh, to say what is uh, influenced the most. As I see from the point of view, because I was I was re researching Ukrainian migration for 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 a couple of years now in the Czech Republic, I see the huge again a bit similar, but even to more extent. The huge, uh, the huge um, uh, um, coordination and uh, and rate, uh, um, race of awareness among Ukrainian immigrants who are here in the Czech Republic, the attitudes towards Ukrainian as a as a flexible and cheap labor, and Ukrainians themselves, into a certain extent, perceiving themselves like this in the Czech society, are now starting to again, to feel like in terms of their national identity, in terms of their proudness of being a part of Ukraine. It's also important. It's uh, for, for those migrants. Uh, we also, and by the way, we, uh, we talked about refugees, but uh, there are also statistics of those labor migrants returning back home, either to fight in the army or to contribute somehow. And uh, there are still voices, even in terms of employment, we mentioned like, yes, they expect that refugees will uh, will join the labor market, but then still in countries like the Czech Republic, there are much more opportunities for male migrants. And there is a huge lack of male migrants now because some of them are living, some of them are busy uh, taking holidays because they're volunteering, helping Ukraine. And uh, many of them cannot come to the Czech Republic, right? So there are a lot of, a lot of huge changes ahead of us. And as someone who is uh, involved in research and migration, I I think that we have a lot of work ahead of us. We were we are discussing now. We uh, we added several questions to the omnibus, the Czech public opinion uh, uh, survey, and then we are discussing the methods of how how we can uh, how we can study the refugees and their needs and their integration. So the, a lot of soci societal changes. Uh, which are ahead of us, and I think that many of them will have very long-term, uh, uh, long-term um, will affect us in a long-term perspective. I'm not sure I answered. All your thank questions. you. No, thank you very much, Kat, uh, Jana. I, uh, I completely agree. Like, uh, I, I really appreciate you all coming here and willing to share your thoughts, and it's it's really. Um, it, 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 we really speak on the spot because there's no research, things are happening in front of our eyes and the situation might change tomorrow or day after. And uh, therefore, yeah, I completely agree with you that this, this is a, a significant change, significant social change, and we should really look for the, for the consequences of it in future. Kat, uh, Katia, please. Yeah, to support Jana's argument, uh, I, I just want to share with you that I came across a number of 80,000 males coming back from Poland back to Ukraine, returning migrants ready to fight. And I just wanted to emphasize that for me, the difference of this current, let's say, migration situation, migration phenomenon, uh, no, the way it is different, very different from the previous crises is that we have an issue of common agenda. I think the conflict or war that is going on in Ukraine is something which anyone in Europe can understand. The drivers, the reasons. And just to remind, it has started with the ultimatum of Putin to the Europe, to NATO, not to Ukraine. So it was something at stake and you know, it was a 
um, it was a conflict between the Russia and the Western world and the, you know, the various system of the Western world. So this is a kind of civilizational conflict. This is not Ukraine-Russia war. This is much more than that. And I think this common agenda is something that should be the make the background for you know for policies within this migration crisis, for solidarity networks within this migration crisis, and also the role of diaspora or diaspora, Ukrainian diasporas, and actually many other Slavic or Eastern diasporas in Western countries is huge in you know forming and shaping the lobby to the governments. And I think this this now should become the front of the you know utmost importance to make the Ukrainian or taking it wider uh, Russian versus Europe uh, war. Ev everyone, everyone business. This is not not out on my backyard problem. This is my backyard problem, and this should be this should be deal dealt with this idea in mind. This is a common agenda conflict. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all the speakers. I have seen that most of the questions as well have been answered. There's one question by uh, Jonah about uh, there are many, whether there are any parallels of the current crisis and the crisis resulting from the Yugoslav war in that might uh, inform longer term European response. Actually, Jonah, this is already happening. The temporary protection directive that the panelists were talking about in the first part of the talk uh, it, uh, it this protection directive has been put in place by the EU exactly as the aftermath of the Balkan conflict to ensure that the EU has at its disposal a legal tool to prevent a, a future uh, to, to accommodate uh, people that would flee as a result of the war. So that it, that that directive now is being implemented, of course, differently in different countries, because that's the uh, value of the EU law, that there is some flexibility in which uh, uh, it can be implemented. But yeah, I would definitely see that it's it's uh, it's it's that uh, that protection put in the aftermath of the Balkan conflict that now enables the EU better response to the uh, to the to the current displacement. Uh, I uh, I'm afraid uh, that's all we will have time for uh, today. I would really like to thank uh, the speakers. Uh, Karolina Łukasiewicz, Olena Fiduk, uh, Jana Leontiewa, Katarina Waszenko, and Frank Duvel for uh, uh, giving their time to, 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 to spend with me this one and a half hours and our uh, uh, amazing uh, audience and participants to, to ponder on those really serious consequences of one of the, the, the most serious humanitarian crises in Europe since the Second World War. Uh, and uh, as Ben said at the beginning, uh, this is only a first of a series of events that we will be organizing at SEAS. And I hope you will stay tuned and stay with us uh, in future. All the um, announcements will be shared as widely as possible. Thank you so very much my, to my participants. Thank you so very much to the audience. And I wish you a, all a good evening. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.